Uh, the title of today's message is going to be, The Lord Always Has a Plan. And the Lord always does have a plan. A lot of his plans, unfortunately, because the sinfulness of mankind um, is to have to redeem us. You know, we have sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. We, our sins separate us. So what did God plan to do? He planned to redeem us. He sent his son into the world to die for our sins. Um, we see in the Bible, and sometimes we look at it because there's so much history, there's so much time that went by that we say, well, that was for the apostles. Uh, that was for the followers of that, at that time. And we kind of let time separate us from the fact that he has a plan for all of us personally. So every single person in this room, whether you believe it or not, realize it or not, God has a plan for your life. Now, if I can just kind of focus on a brief timeline, if you look at the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, a lot of good teachings, a lot of things in the scripture, in the gospels, um, further New Testament books confirm that, but Jesus had to go to the cross. He had to die for our sins. He said as such to his followers, he kept reminding them so it wouldn't be a shock when it happened, and his sole focus when he went to the cross was so that we could be redeemed, to die for our sins, okay? Um, three days later, he rises from the dead. Uh, again, as I said in my prayers, a, a seal of authenticity. Everything that he said, all the years that he did ministry, all the teachings, is a pretty bold claim because nobody else could make that claim and nobody did what he did. So rising from the dead was a seal of authenticity. A lot of believers who maybe don't read the Bible that much don't realize that he spent 40 days on the earth after he rose from the dead his post-resurrection ministry. Now, I believe, my personal opinion, is that he did that because he had to show himself that he was risen from the dead. Remember, there wasn't Facebook, oh, look, Jesus rose from the dead. You know, it wasn't Snapchat. Yeah, I took a picture of the empty tomb, and there was some angels hanging out over there. So 40 days, he had to go around, and he had to show himself to the various followers, and I believe the reason he did that was because the heavy Roman persecution that was coming brutal Roman persecution. And as new as this belief was, it would have been snuffed out had he not risen from the dead. Then he ascended into heaven. Now, my belief as well, or actually what I'd like to do in this message, is to really focus on a sliver of time, a sliver of a few days before the crucifixion and a few hours before the crucifixion, and to kind of present the case that his idea of his death was only a blip. It was only a little speed bump in eternity. There were things that he did days before and hours before that signaled that he was going to rise from the dead and that he had a plan for his followers and for even uh, those of us today because of the actions that he took. So we'll check that out. You know, what did he do? Why did he do it? What does it mean? What's the significance? We'll look at that. I'm going to take uh, eight small pieces of this using various scriptures in chronological order. So each successive scripture, we're getting closer to the resurrection or the crucifixion and subsequent resurrection. And we'll jump in. So the first one is the triumphal entry. This is really neat. Matthew 21, starting with verse 1. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. You know, Jesus uh, confined himself to a human body, but he could also see the things that were going around. He could read minds. He was God in the flesh. So he didn't completely empty himself the kenosis of, of, of God. He was fully God and fully man. Very interesting kind of hybrid that took place that God instituted. Only he could figure these things out. So he knew that questions would be asked, hey, what are you doing with that donkey? And the question did get asked, and the disciples in, in the other gospels did say that, and he said, okay, take, take him. So all this was done, verse 4, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, Zechariah, actually, uh, centuries before, quote, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey, end quote. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. 
They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their garments on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So the plan was, at a certain time in human history, was for him to reveal himself as the Messiah, as God in the flesh, as the Redeemer, as it, get, as it got closer to the crucifixion. As a matter of fact, we covered the prophet Daniel. Uh, he actually showed up this day to the day to present himself as the Messiah, the King. And the Lord's plan today is also to reveal himself to us, right? Again, we, we can't let 2,000 years separate us from the personal touch that the Lord has with us. As a matter of fact, in Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, God says, if you will seek me, you will be found by me if you seek me with a whole heart. So even today, that promise is still there. God wants everyone to seek him. Remember, he gave us free will. We're free moral agents. We could accept him or not accept him. That's the beauty of love. Love is not forced. So even this morning, you can say, you know what? I, I do want to seek this God that you're talking about. And every year, through different messages, people do. They, they go from their life of just thinking about their goals and their plans and their future to, well, I wonder what's God's goal for me? What's his plan for me? You see what I'm saying? So two, again, we're getting closer. The Lord's rebuke of a religious system, actually, that had very come, become very corrupt, very money-focused, and turned off a lot of people. And today I hear the same thing. Um, and, and again, Jesus rebuked this type of system. Okay? Let's check this out. In Matthew 23, 1 through 15. Getting a lot of scripture here this morning. For those that are just going to come back on Easter, uh, excuse me, Christmas, there's a lot to chew on, so uh, i got to get a lot in here. Uh, Matthew 23, starting with verse 1, it says, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees, now these were the religious echelon at the time. And today, some people are turned off by religious echelon today. Okay. They sit in Moses' seat, therefore whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. It's very easy to tell, it's very easy for me to tell you all what to do. Easy thing to do. But it's a harder thing for me to live it myself. You see what I'm saying? And unfortunately, this is, was the idea at the time, this is what they were doing. Jesus said, they know the Bible, they know the word, listen to what they're saying, but don't follow them because they're hypocrites. He says, for they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Burdensome religion. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best seats at the feast, the best seats in the synagogues. Greetings in the marketplace and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. They love the accolades. But you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled or abased. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. So some of you might not have heard this. It's pretty powerful. You wonder why they crucified him. But Jesus used that opportunity to die for our sins. So mankind thought they were getting rid of him, but it was just the beginning. So what do we find here? We find that, that after Jesus was to be raised from the grave, risen from the dead, that he did want 
there to be a church. And he did want some biblical purity to the church, some doctrinal purity to the church, not hypocritical, not predatory, not false representations of Christ. And again, some in this very room might have been turned off by this type of um, echelon that, uh, that dominated the people so many years ago. And unfortunately, that spirit, 2,000 years later, is still alive in some ministries. But what is the Lord's plan? The Lord's plan is for you and I to be a part of his church. He does want some organization in the church, right? And there's a lot of criticism today. You know, we look out at the world, and especially in our culture, there's a lot of unrest. People are unhappy. There's a lot of protest. There's a lot of marches. But how many actually want to be a part of the solution? Do we want to be a part of the solution? You know, people in the church can be critical too. We can criticize, criticize, criticize. But do we want to be a part of the solution? Because that's what God wants. That's his plan for our life, for everybody here to be part of what he does in his ministry. Listen, you could have gone today to some church that's a, a, a major production. They spend all kinds of money, and it's so incredible, and it reduces you to a spectator. But that's not God's plan for you. His plan for you is to be part of what he's doing. You see what I'm saying, right? So when we come and we listen to a sermon, is it to, to be entertained or is it to be a part of what God's word is trying to say? Jesus has always been wanting to pull people in and to use him for his glory. Three, Christ's return. Okay, we're getting closer to the, the crucifixion. Uh, Matthew 24, three through eight. So Jesus and his disciples are spending some time together and they have a lot of questions. They want to know some things. Uh, it says, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And when, what will be the sign of your coming or your second coming and of the end of the age, the end of human history? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. This is important as well. So Jesus, and again, the disciples really had a hard time with this whole crucifixion, as you can imagine. Imagine being with the Son of God, and he's raising the dead, and he's miraculously feeding people. Every day was probably incredibly exciting, you know, forgiving people's sins, lame people were walking. And Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm going to the cross, you know, I'm going to be crucified. That was a hard thing for them to swallow, as it would be for us if we were in their shoes. But what Jesus was trying to assure his followers is that, when he was to be ascended, that he would come again, but also to inoculate believers against false teachings. Very important. Again, what he did before had repercussions and ramifications after the resurrection. So the Lord's plan for us is to, to know him, right? To understand him, what is, what is, what's being said in his word. To have that intimate relationship with him, not only through prayer and through uh, interaction, but also his word. You know, would you, how many people today, if, I don't know, stopping shops down the road, you know, if some guy was in there with a robe and sandals and he just started healing people, would you make the assumption that's, that that's Jesus Christ? Well, if you know the word, you would know, well, I know I'm seeing miracles here, but that's not him because Christ already told me how he would return. When I was a police officer, I can tell you, I came in contact with about half a dozen guys that really thought that they were Jesus Christ. And instead of bowing down and worshiping them, I called for backup. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm no dummy. <laughs> because I knew enough of the Bible to know Jesus isn't coming back in a Toyota. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> he's coming back in a white horse. So I, I don't know what I'm dealing with right now. But um, listen, the bottom line is this. <laughs> Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's participatory right? Everything that the Lord did, everything that he said had meaning. Everything, like Jesus said, every jot or tittle in the, world, in the word would come to pass. 
And as believers, every single thing we read in this book has meaning. Has meaning. Okay, continuing on. Jesus eats Passover with his disciples and institutes communion. Matthew 26. Starting with verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Wow. That's pretty impressive. That the Lord Jesus wanted his disciples to understand Passover, right? Passover's fulfillment. And also to institute this rite where we remember the sacrifice that he made for us. Two most important things in all of eternity. And we can think of a lot of things that are on our mind that we think are important. But two, two most important things is number one, that sinful human beings could not dwell with a holy and perfect God. It's not possible. Honestly, I can understand. I mean, humankind has made a mess of this world. You know, God's not going to let them, us, make a mess of his kingdom. So he had to do something that would cleanse us from our sins. So two things in communion is one, looking back to his sacrifice for our sins, very important but also looking forward to the fact that he's going to remake everything. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. There's going to be this millennial kingdom. We went over some of this, that even the animals will be in harmony with each other. That's exciting. Uh, and he wants us to be a part of that. So two major things that we see in what he instituted, and I'll go a little bit further when we partake of communion this morning. But, you know, th this, is, this is what's going on here. Uh, the, the fifth thing we'll look at, we have a few more to go. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. If we look at John 13, 4 through 8. So Jesus, okay, when you look at the Gospels, there's actually a, a Bible that was written called the Chronological Bible, which is really neat. It takes all the pieces and puts them together in order chronologically. So that's what we're doing. But in John 13, verse 4, so he rises from supper right? This a few hours before he's going to be killed. He's going to be crucified. And he laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself like a servant would do. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. So this is amazing. Peter said, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, if I do not wash your feet, you will have no part with me. So the washing of the disciples' feet. Now, there was a, a few times, and listen, we, we can't pick on the disciples too much because we're not perfect either. We're also sinners, and we let things get to our head. But there was, on more than one occasion, where the disciples would kind of almost maybe have a little discussion about who was the greatest disciple or who would be like one of his best generals, so to speak. Uh, and Jesus now shows them an object lesson to kind of change the channel. And this is important. Well, what, a lot of people, what is him washing their, first of all, it was the job for servants. Jesus girded his waist with a, a cloth and he put water in a basin and you know, it wasn't like today, you go out and you get dirty, you have work boots and there's waterproof boots. You know, they had open-toed sandals and shoes. So when you came to somebody's house, you could make a mess and track the dirt all over the place. So there would be somebody's job to actually wash your feet and anoint your head with oil and do all these really neat things so that you could be comfortable uh, as a guest in that person's house. So Jesus now getting down to wash the disciples' feet was uncomfortable to the disciples. Here's the Son of God, fully God, fully man, you know, the creator of all eternity, washing their feet. I'd be uncomfortable too. But Jesus said, you, you got to permit this. So what he was doing is he was teaching them humility. He was teaching them how to serve, right? The minister, the teacher, the TV preacher can never be truly great in God's eyes until he learns to serve. 
Should clergy be pampered and seek wealth and act as if they're above everyone else today? No, because what Jesus instituted was purity. We're supposed to take that model. So how does that happen today? It's because people aren't reading their Bibles. They're not teaching the Bible. You know, we're supposed to love and to serve others. And to deny oneself to bless somebody else, is, it, it goes against our flesh. It goes against our nature. It really does. But we're to learn what was God's plan, that when the church was instituted after the resurrection, that we were to learn as his servants to also serve others. You know, there was this really neat, and it's kind of a, a teaching model, and the model is I do, we do, you do. And, and God did this through his son. Jesus, I do. Jesus raised the dead. He healed the sick. He fed people. He loved people. He showed compassion, and the disciples would watch. And then Jesus would do, we do. Jesus would have the disciples come with him, and they would do it too with him. You know what was interesting? After Jesus died and rose again and ascended into heaven, then it was the Lord Jesus looked at his followers as you do because he was removed. So now it was his followers' job to carry on what he had instituted. And amazingly, it's happened for 2,000 years. Now, is there some problems? Sure there are. Are there some people doing it that is not according to the biblical model? Sure there are. But this is what he was trying to teach. Did Jesus act like a man on death row? I submit to you that he did not. He did not. He wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking of what was going to happen after his resurrection and ascension. And that's what he was teaching his followers. Six, the vine and the branches. John 15. John 15, 1 through 8. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Notice the conditional statements. We have them in the English. If, then. If, after, if those requirements are met, then after, then, then that takes place. If the if isn't met, then the end doesn't, then the then doesn't happen. So what he's saying here, again, God has given us free will. Will we abide in him, folks? Will we, I don't know, maybe it's nice to have a label as a Christian, my friends are Christian, my parents, you know, brought me up as Christians, or are we really Christians? I work a lot in the garage on cars and but I'm not a mechanic, you know what I'm saying? You don't want me working on your car. Uh, just because we were brought up in a Christian home or go to a church doesn't make us Christians. Are we abiding in Jesus Christ? That's very important. Is it a relationship versus a religion? Again, these are Jesus' teachings. They're not mine. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to go what he says. Do we know Jesus? Because he wants us to know him. I'll give you another example from the world. Uh, so you could have your favorite ball player, right? You know all of his stats. You know his wife's name. You know the name of his children and how many kids he has. You love this ball player. You know where he lives. And one day, he's out at an event, and you're close. You're within like 30 feet, and you want to go see this ball player because you know, well, you don't know him because you know of him. And as you get closer, you call out his name and his security tackles you to the ground, you know? And you say, but I know where you live, and I know your kids' names. Probably you'll be in handcuffs, and you'll be down at the station for stalking. Why? Because you know of him, but you don't know him. And he doesn't know you. A lot of people know of a man named Jesus, and they look at the paintings, and I don't know, they assume he has long hair, and, uh, you know, 
they assume a lot of things about Jesus, but they don't know him. That's why Jesus spoke about the vine and the branches. There's an intimacy there, right? We either are the branches and we, we draw from the vine, which is him, the source, or we don't. You know, it's one of those things. You either know the Lord or you don't know the, the Lord. And we can fool other people, but we can't fool God. So do we know him or we, do, or we know of him? See, sometimes when you read the scripture, it's, it's poignant, it's it's, it's piercing, it's convicting, because not because God wants to be mean, but because he wants us to know him. So if you want to go back to God's plan, what happened before the crucifixion, right? What happened after the resurrection? What happened after the ascension? We're living in that time period. Do we know him? Because his plan is for us to know him, a voluntary thing, so that he can work out his plan and his plan for our lives in us on a daily basis. Seven, Jesus prays to the Father for disciples, for the disciples, and all of us that would come afterward. John 17, 20 through 26. This is a powerful prayer. Again, we're a few hours away from the crucifixion. We already, I'm not going to cover the part, he already prayed for his specific disciples. Here he prays for all believers that would come afterwards. He says, I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's amazing. When the Lord was to be resurrected, he's to spend the 40 days, he ascends into heaven. And those of us, right, that read his word and we believe in him through the word and through the power of the Holy Spirit. It says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. All the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. This is something that, as human beings, we haven't figured out how to do. To actually live as inside somebody else. To be, you know, it's our skin is a barrier to each other. But Jesus speaks in these, these metaphors. He speaks in this oneness. He speaks in, in being in God and God in us. And that's amazing because when Jesus gave his Holy Spirit, when we believe, a part of God actually resides in us in the form of the Holy Spirit. That's something you can't get as human beings because our skin is a barrier. But the Lord has figured out a way that when we do become believers, that he's with us all the time. He counsels us, he helps us, he warns us, he teaches us, and he is in us. So you read what Jesus says, and you're like, wow, that's, that's deep. It is deep, and it's only something that God can do. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, uh, who you gave me, may be with me where I am that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known you that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty deep there. But the Lord's plan is, well, to be praying for us. You know, he prayed, he constantly prayed, and it was curious to the disciples. They would just see him, you know, they, they didn't get it. There was crowds, right? Human beings, people love crowds. Oh, that's for me? Wow, I'm, I'm a celebrity, I'm a star. And the disciples couldn't get it right away that Jesus would sometimes withdraw from the crowds and go to a place by himself and just commune with the Father. It was something that they had to learn. Prayer is very powerful. It's a way to reach God no matter where we are could be on a desert island and there's not, no life on that island. And you can pray and God is right there. It's very, very powerful. The power of prayer. His desire is also, and you know what's amazing? Jesus said this. He said, don't, don't pray rep repetitive prayers over and over again. He goes, the heathen do that. They think they will be heard by their many words. Prayer is a conversation with God to actually talk to the living God. As he made your individuality and your person and your personality, well, he's also a person. He has personality. So why would we give him something we just memorize and say that we can say in our sleep? 
We talk to him. We share our dreams, our hopes, our desires, our concerns with him. Prayer, very, very, very important. And his plan is for us to communicate with him through prayer. Well, not long after this, Jesus is arrested. He's beaten. He's eventually crucified. But something remarkable happens on the third day. He rises from the dead. If we go to 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 3, here's the Apostle Paul who came later on, who didn't walk with the original 12, but he believed in Jesus Christ. It says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. This was all prophesied many times in the Old Testament. And that he was seen by Cephas, or Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep, which is a euphemism for they have passed away. So remember what I was saying, that 40-day post-resurrection ministry. When I was a nominal believer and just kind of dawdling my faith in a, in a denomination and never really putting anything into it, I never knew half the stuff that was in here. I never knew he spent 40 days, a month and 10 days on the earth, appearing to people. I mean, that's amazing. Over 500 at once. After that, he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, the Apostle Paul speaking, as one born out of due time. One born out of due time. You see, Resurrection Sunday is not about bunnies or eggs or it's not even about some ministries that put together this big production so that we could be wowed and we could you know get tingly and go home and not consider God right resurrection Sunday is about God's plan of Jesus being resurrected to life again and his plan is also for us to be resurrected to life see when we die when we come into this world we're alive physically but we're dead spiritually that's the human condition and at some point, hopefully in everyone's life, if they received Christ, their spirit is, is revived, is quickened. They are resurrected unto life. And that's why Jesus speaks about being born again as a baby. So you could be 60 years old and come to Christ today. In, <laughs> in human years, you're 60 years old. Your flesh, your organs, you know, we're, we're kind of going downhill at that point. I'm 50 and I'm feeling it. Uh, but... But when you accept Christ as your Savior, you're a baby in spiritual years. You have your whole eternity ahead of you. So it's an amazing thing. It's like a dichotomy of flesh and spirit happening at the same time. It's very deep when you really look at it. You know, we pass from death unto life because of the promises that God gives us. Everything written in the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. There's a purpose. And again, his plan is to call his prodigals home to call those, even with free will, to, to woo them, to, uh, to draw them through the word uh, so that they turn and receive him. For a holy God to seek his lost children and then to impart and infuse to us the plan that he has for our lives. Again, the resurrection means that now we do. We do. We do. The resurrection was designed to get us all to participate in a living faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. So this morning, I just wanted to take, again, a sliver of time, days and hours. You can put everything together, and you can see the big picture. You can see for yourself individually that through the things that he did just prior to the crucifixion, 2,000 years later, after his ascension, what his plan is for your life, if you're willing. Again, we're not called to be spectators we're called to be participants. Happy Resurrection Day. Let's pray.